Uh, something I am extremely fascinated with and something I like reading books about, doing nerdy research online about, is about people who've made an influence in the past and were still influenced by them today. So people like Albert Einstein, Steve Jobs, um, George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, these people who had a passion, had a desire for something that is bigger than themselves, and when they passed away, we are still being affected by their lives. They've changed something. They decided to go after something and leave everything behind and change the world, and we're still seeing what they did today. Um, they, let, they often sacrifice time. They sacrifice money, and sometimes, unfortunately, they sacrifice their family. Get to the point that we are today, and we're influenced by these people. One of my favorites is this guy. And I'll be honest, the reason that I might have originally liked him is because of the guy on your right-hand side, that little mouse there. This is Walt Disney. And I'm fascinated with the fact that he did something that we're still talking about today, even though he passed away in 1966. He had this vision that he would create a place, he would create movies that both children and adults could go to. And they could go to and they'd have fun. And that's what you see when you watch his movies. And that's what you get when you go to his theme parks. In 1966, he passed away. Uh, Sixteen years later, they opened up Epcot Center, and Epcot Center was kind of a nod to the future, kind of their view of what the future could be like. So they wanted to do it big. They wanted to have a big celebration like Disney would have done. And as they did it, they hired a band, they hired all these things, and they, they thought it would be a good idea to have Mrs. Disney come and do the honorary ribbon cutting at the time. So as they had this ceremony, um, the MC's announcing it, and then he says, Mrs. Disney, would you come and join me on stage to cut the ribbon? And as she's coming up on stage, the MC looks down at her and says, I wish Walt could have seen this. And this little lady looks up to him and says, he did. He did see it. He did. He had a vision that predicted, that knew that these things were going to happen because he had a passion. He had a desire. And because of that, we still know who he is, and we still know what he did. Now, there was only one Walt Disney. There's only one Steve Jobs. There's only one George Washington. There's one, only one Abraham Lincoln. But there are hundreds, if not thousands, of people who are still carrying on that vision, still carrying on that desire today. We may not know their names. We may not know their desires. We may not know much about them. But we know them because of the person that guided them. We know them because they have passion, because their desires, and they left along, left behind a legacy. I believe if you were to ask every teenager around here, majority of them would say, I want to be the next Steve Jobs. I want to be the next Walt Disney. I want to be the next. You can fill in the blank because they want to leave a legacy. And the majority of us has that ingrained into our hearts as well. We want to leave a legacy that makes a difference for people to come. We want to do something that changes the world. We don't want to just settle for mediocrity. We want to do something that changes the world like Walt did. But I think if that's our goal and that's our desire, and we should have these big dreams, we should have these desires, but what if that's not really what God wants? What if God says, I already have a Walt Disney, I don't need another one of those. I don't need another Steve Jobs, I don't need another Abraham Lincoln, I've already had those. What I need is someone just to show up. I need a someone to be there, and I need a someone just to do that. So today what I want to talk about is not necessarily the big names, not necessarily the people that you'll ever hear about, not necessarily anybody that you'll ever get to know. And you may not, we might not even know what they did, but we will know the results of what they did because of who they were and because they stood up. So today I want to talk about the someone or the someones that did something that changed everything. And because of that, we are changed today. So if you have your Bibles, turn to First or Second Kings. And we're going to talk about the cycle of kings. See, the kings had one job, and that one job was to point everybody to God. That was their sole purpose. In the second kings, in first kings, their whole job, point people to God. But they continue, got distracted. Melody. By the bright, shiny objects of this world. They got distracted by things that came in their life. They got distracted by things that got in their way. And God says, these things that you allow in your life, these things that you allow to be there, there are things that are going to be distractions. There are things that are going to take you away. And God says, these bright, shiny objects, they're distractions. You can't allow them. God says, focus on me. See, the bright, shiny objects that we have in our life are always going to pull us away. They're always going to take us away from what God has planned for us like. So the kings of this time decided to search after these bright, shiny objects. 
these kings at this time decided not to follow after God. They knew that God loved them, but they said they looked over to the left, they looked over the right, and they saw these cities, they saw these cultures, and what they saw was something that they didn't have. And they decided to seek after that instead of seek after what God had planned for them. And when they did, God said, that's fine, I love you, and God removed his hand of protection on them. See, God loves us enough to say, you know what, if you, I love you, but I'm going to let you choose what you want to do. And God let them walk away. And when they walked away, he lifted his hand of protection, and then they would eventually become in captivity. So the cycle of kings looks something like this. You have a king that serves God, and then you have a king that follows him that unfortunately doesn't serve God. He gets distracted by these, the bright, shiny objects. And as he's distracted, he leads his people away because he's supposed to point the people to God. And they follow, and they get, go through pain, they go through suffering. And then a king eventually has to come along and say, I'm going to serve God, and as we, I serve God, his people will serve God. And that cycle continues on and on because the next king is going to probably not serve God. And it's kind of a sad, sad story that we read and we're like, why do they continually choose this? Why do they continually ignore God? Why don't they continually follow God? Why, why do they continually settle for the things of this world? Why can't they do get it right? And the simple answer is, as we're reading this, and this is the answer you can fill in for just about every answer in church. The answer is Jesus. They should have served Jesus. They should have followed after Jesus. But no, they didn't. They saw the bright, shiny object. They saw the thing that they shouldn't have pursued, but they went after that. They saw the thing over there that looked cooler and neater, and they decided to go after that. And we read this story, and we have kind of a helicopter, kind of like a bird's eye view of history. We know the cycle. We know what's going to happen. A king serves God. A king doesn't serve God. A king serves God. A king doesn't serve God. We know the simple answer is Jesus, but we know that they didn't do it. And we kind of start scratching our heads and we start wondering, why did they do this? Why do they continually fall? Why do they keep messing up? The same is true when you read the story of Adam and Eve. We know that Adam and Eve are going to eat that apple. As much as we can say in our heads, don't eat the apple. They're going to eat the apple. They're going to fall for that easy fruit. They're going to go after that thing that they shouldn't have because they look inside of themselves and say, we know God loves us. We know God cares for us. But we know there's something over there and that looks exciting. And it's that easy low-hanging fruit, that comfortableness that they're going to seek after. So look in 2 Kings 2, 13-2. And we're going to talk about a king Jehoahaz. And I'm just going to call him King J because I cannot say that name too many times. King Jehoahaz, King J. And it says that he served or led his people for 17 years. And then it says a phrase that we often read in the Old Testament, King J did what was evil in the sight of of the Lord. And this is a phrase that is repeated over and over to refer to the kings because they did evil. They didn't do what God asked them to do, point to God. They decided to do their own thing. And King Jay did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And he did what we often do with our sins, is that we try to hide our sins. We think our sins are just our sins. And we try to hold them in. We try to hide them underneath rugs, put them in nice little neat containers, and say, this is my sin. It doesn't affect anybody. But King Jay was the leader of God's people. And as the leader of God's people, he's supposed to lead them. But if, you, if he continues to deal with the sin, the people that are following him are also going to be dealing with that same sin. So you can hide your sin. You can try to keep it all to yourself. But that sin is going to affect the people around you. And the Bible says that he did evil in the sight of God. Meaning, he might have tried to hide it underneath the rug, but God says, I see your sin. I see what you're doing. You may think it's a hidden sin, but God says, I see that sin. You can try and hide that and clean that out of your system, but it's still there. So what did he do? The Bible says he committed the sins of Jeroboam. This is another king that starts with the letter J, so it may get a little confusing. The sins of Jeroboam, and if you read that, he committed the sins of Jeroboam, maybe you freak out a little bit, because that sounds pretty scary. The sins of Jeroboam, and we get stressed out, but we really don't, because nobody probably knows what the sins of Jeroboam are. So we read that the king just Jehoahaz, King J, committed the sins of Jeroboam, and it seems like a foreign concept. It's something that's floating out here in space, and we really can't grasp it. It's like some complex math formula or something that we'll never understand. But he committed the sins of Jeroboam, meaning it was a sin. It was something that he struggled with. It was something that he put in front of God. So let's do something and apply it to our own lives. Let's take the sins of Jeroboam. It's a sin. It's something wrong. And let's make it something we can grasp onto. The sins of Jeroboam, he committed the sin of stealing. We all know what that is. We struggle with that. We know what that is. We're taking something that doesn't belong to us. He committed the sin of stealing, or he committed the sin of lust. We know what the sin of lust is, and now what we're doing is taking this foreign concept, 
making it much simpler that we can understand. And we know when he committed the sins, it was actually something big because now we put a name on these sins. He committed the sins of adultery, and we know what that one is. Again, and it's something that we are applying to. And finally, he committed maybe the sin of murder. See, now we've taken this subject that's way up here that we do not understand, and we brought it down to our own level and said, these are th things that we struggle with. These are things that I struggle with. These are things that, we have, that are going on in our life day in and day out. So it's no longer something that could have happened. It's something that did happen. It's something that is happening to us. And ultimately, what the sins of Jeroboam are the sins of looking away from God. See, the sin of Jeroboam is a king that was before the King Jay that we're talking about. He was a king that was serving God, but all of a sudden he thought it would be a good idea to start building up idols. He just started, started putting things in front of his life. So instead of looking at God, instead of searching after God, what he did was he searched after what he wanted. And he built these idols, he built these bright, shiny objects that led him astray and led his people astray. So he committed the sin of Jeroboam, or he committed the sin of looking away from God, and he said, I no longer need God. I'm going to fill in the blank. I'm going to do whatever I want because I can make it better. And see, we do the same thing when we choose to look away from God. When we choose to look away from God, we are choosing to make our own path and choosing to reject God. We are choosing to do our own thing instead of doing what God has called us to do. And that is when we commit the sins of Jeroboam. And the Bible says the Lord's anger burned against his people. And we struggle and we're like, well, well, of course it burns. He, they continually chose to walk away. They continually said, I don't want you, God. I want to do my own thing. I don't need you, God. I want to do my own thing. If you have kids, something that they'll always do is want more of something good. If you give them a candy bar, could I have another? If you give them a cookie, could I have another? If you give them time that they get to hang out with their friends, they're going to say, could I hang out with more? If you give them money, they're going to want more. For Christmas last year, we gave our kids a video game system, one of the most wonderful inventions in the world, a video game system. They got super excited about it. They loved it, and they're little kids, so simple video games. But we quickly realized that they needed two things with this video game system. They needed a time limit and time when they could play it. In other words, we don't let our kids wake up at 3 in the morning and play video games, because they probably would. We also don't let them play until their eyes would fall out, until their eyes fall out of their sockets, because again they would, and then they would get cranky. But we put limits on their video games. We put limits on how they use their video games, when they use them. The problem is when we say your limit is up or it's time for you to stop, what they say is it's not fair. I need to play it. This is this is my favorite. My son will, my oldest son will say, "This isn't fair. I, I, this is this is what I need." And our second son will say, all I want to do in life is play video games. And he'll have, he'll have a little meltdown just because we said, no, you're done. You are done playing the video games. And I think this is one of the most amazing things about having kids, is that we get a small, very small window into see, seeing what God sees. Because, see, my kids don't really understand the concept of money. They don't understand that a video game system, a vehicle, and a house are expensive, but they don't understand necessarily how expensive they are. They don't necessarily understood how much it cost, the time, the effort that it took to buy this video game system. All they see is that they woke up on Christmas morning and there was a video game system in their basement and the little squirrels in their head just started going crazy and they got super excited about it. All they see is the gift, but when we say, you're done with the gift, they see it as I'm taking away their gift and they forget about the gift. They forget about what we gave them, and all they see is a restriction on their life. The same is true with the Israelites. See, the Israelites were brought out of Egypt. God brought them out of Egypt through a man named Moses, and they whined. He then took them through the desert. He provided for them, gave them food, gave them shelter, did all this for them, and the Israelites whined. He then took them right up to the doorstep of the land that he said he was going to give them. They knocked on the door. They looked into this promised land, and they said, we can't go in there because we don't have an army, because we don't have soldiers. We can't go in there and fight. But they forgot. God told them, I'm going to give this to you. Go in and take it. Too often we look at what we don't have instead of remembering what God has given to us. Too often we focus on our lacks instead of remembering that God has given us so much. So back to our King Jay. His one purpose in life was to point people to God. But that was the one thing he didn't do. Every morning, he should have woke up and looked in the mirror and say, I'm going to point people to God. 
But every morning he did not do that. He said, pointed people away from God. And he pointed people towards other things. And this is why it's so important that you pray for your leaders of this country, of your city, of your state. Pray for all your leaders because God allowed them to be where they are. And they each have a choice. Will they point to God or will they point away from God? It's always their choice. And they need to be encouraged. So God is mad, rightly so, because his people said, I don't want you, I don't need you, and they decided to do their own thing. And it says that they walked away spiritually, meaning they no longer connected to God, there was no talking, no communication, and then they walked away physically because it says God raised up a king named Aram to come in and take them by force to another area. And this is where we stand up and say, this is not fair. This is not fair. I'm a person of God. I follow God. This is not fair because I'm American. This is not fair because I live in Clinton, Iowa. This is not fair. And your list goes on and on. But we continually rejected God. We continually walked away from God. God said, I love you. I want the best for you. But you and I continually walked away. And the Israelites walked away and said, I'm going to do my own thing. This is what happens when we put our job, our relationships, that thing, that object, whatever, that person in front of God. And we say, this is more important to me, God. You can wait. We commit the sins of Jeroboam when we choose to put something before God. And this blank, I'm going to leave blank. So you get to fill it in whatever you struggle with. Don't look at your neighbors. No cheating or no looking. You can fill it in mentally or you can fill it in physically, however you want to. But whatever you struggle with, you commit the sins of whatever when we choose something before God. Because that object, that thing, that relationship, whatever it is, is distracting you and eventually taking you away from God. And God says, I love you, but I'm going to let you choose. And I'm going to let you walk away from me. He says, I care for you, but you still get to choose. Carrying on, then King Jay asked the Lord to show his favor. Asked God to show his favor. And he asked him to do the most amazing thing. See, this is a great great lesson in just parenting. See, God doesn't, like, what what I would do, if you have to ask your kids, like, 50 times to clean their room, you start getting frustrated, right? So, clean your room, clean your room, clean your room, clean your room, and you get frustrated with it. And God doesn't, it doesn't say that God did that. God didn't throw a lightning bolt at him. God didn't uh, make him sneeze green things or something like that. God didn't do anything incredible. He just said, all right, and I'm going to do something. I'm going to help you. See, as parents, we get frustrated, but God says, I am here, and I am ready, and I'm waiting for you to choose me. But why did he suddenly choose? Why did he suddenly change? You read the next sentence. It says, the Lord listened to him, listened to King Jay. The Lord saw how badly the king of Aram, that's the king that took him over, was treating Israel. So they're in pain, they're in suffering. But what caused King Jay to call out? What caused him to do that? What caused him to go out of his way to say, I need you, God. I need you in my life. I need you and I need you more than anything. And the Bible says that the Lord saw how badly. And I read that and I was like, the Lord saw. So was the Lord sleeping? And I think maybe the Lord had his eyes closed. And we read it and say, well, maybe he was just sleeping, maybe taking a time out. Or maybe he just left that area and wasn't really to pay attention. But what we have to remember is that the Bible was inspired by God, but written by man. So it wasn't God's eyes that were closed, but it was King Jay's eyes that were closed. And his eyes were closed and said, God, I don't want you. And he chased after those bright, shiny objects. But it's when he remembered God, it's remembered that Jesus loved him. He remembered that there was a God that said, King Jay, you have one purpose. And I love you and I care for you. That's when his eyes were open. It wasn't God's eyes that were open. God saw what they were going through. God knew what they were going through. And he watched him go through it. And I think it's often like a bad TV show that just keeps playing over and over from God's point of view because he can't shut it off. He, can't, he continually watches the children continually reject him day after day after day. For 17 years, they rejected God. So it wasn't God's eyes that are open, but it was King Jay's eyes that are open. If you don't know, uh, Courtney, who's not in here this time, uh, and I have five children Five, and some of you got a little weak in the knees just hearing that. We have five children, and I will admit to you that I, I don't know if Cor- uh, Courtney has never done this. She's perfect. Uh, but I have lost one child one time, maybe a few times. And I, I do the whole numbering thing, the one, two, three, four. Yep, I'm missing one. And the number five is immobile right now. He can't walk. He's too little, little, little squatty. 
So then I get a little nervous and I start counting again. Oh, yep, we're missing one. It's usually P, our number four, little Penelope. She's a little squatty one. She tends to hide. Uh, she's also the one more likely to put you in a headlock of all of our children. She's a little feisty. But she tends to wander off and we tend to lose her because that's just who she is. She just doesn't care, I think. I don't know. She's too little to care. But we get concerned when we lose her. We search for her. We go after her. Everything we take, we give. We put everything aside and say, we're going to find her. It's happened here at church with uh, fin- Finley once we lost her. And I had no idea where she was. So we, we kept walking around the church over and over finding her. She was in the bathroom staring at herself in the mirror. That's where she was. But we got scared. We got nervous. And you start playing these scenarios over and over in your head. Oh, what if somebody took her or something happened? See, and we searched after. We gave everything. People tried to talk to me. I said, ah, no, no, no. It can wait. I got to find this girl. She's crazy. Got to find her. But God's the same way. God's going to seek after us. But God isn't hiding. God knows where we are at all times, or God doesn't see us as hiding. God is always watching us. God is always seeing us, and God knows where we are. So my children walk away, and I don't know where they are, but God can see us at all times and says, I know where you are. So we say, we walk away, and God says, I see you. We take a break and God says, I see you, but I'm waiting for you. The Bible says, draw near to me and he will draw near to us. Or run after him and he will run after us. In other words, he is waiting for us, saying, I love you, I care for you, my arms are ready for you. You just have to choose that first step. You have to seek after him. We have to draw after him. So King Jay's eyes were open because he remembered that there was a God that said, I loved you and I cared for you and I want something better for you. But what was the thing that caused those eyes to be open? The reality is the time you have to think about what the Israelites were doing. The Israelites weren't having a fun time. They were now slaves, meaning their life was not very good. And you don't become a slave to make, or people don't take you over, don't take societies over so that they can have popcorn and and watch movies with you. They take you over so that they can have you be their workers. You can be their farmers. You can be their builders. You can do all the work that they don't want to do. And it's a great system because it builds that, citizen, or that civilization up and keeps you down. But what would happen is to the Israelites is that they'd eventually be asked to do more and more. They'd be asked to do more farming. They'd be asked to build more things. And as they did more and more, that would mean the pain and suffering would continue. And the hurt would continue. And the suffering would continue. See, it's often we call it to God in our pain. We call it in the, to God in our suffering. When things get difficult... That's when we call it to God. There's not a lot of prayer requests to the church of the open door for people that say, I'm having a great day today. Thank you. Most of the time, people ask for prayer requests when they're suffering, when they're in pain, and they want help, and they want a way out. They're looking for that. We don't go to the doctors when things are great. We go to the doctors when we're hurting. We don't go to just talk to the doctor. We usually go there when we're hurting and when we're in pain. And the same is true with God's people. They don't call out to God until they're in pain, until they're in suffering. And that's what happened to King Jay, because his pain and suffering of him and his people got so severe that he remembered there's a God who loves him, there's a God who cares for him, and there's a God that says, I want the best for you. And he remembered that. And his eyes were open. See, if we live a life of comfort and we live a life of cushiness and we settle for living in a hammock and everything's great, we never call out to God. But unfortunately, we have to get to the point often that we call out to God. And that means we sometimes have to go through pain to remember that God loves us. We go through pain and remember there's a God who cares for us. Unfortunately, a city, a nation has to go through pain to remember that God says, I care for you and I want something best for you. And when we talk about people going through pain, people suffering, some of you guys even have people of people images in your brain of people that you know are continually choosing wrong choices. And what are we doing along those people? What are we doing with those people? How are we helping them out? See, some people would say, ha, you continually rejected God, you deserve this. But what we need to do is just the opposite. Say, you continually rejected God, I'm here. What can I do to help? What can I do to help you get through this pain? What can I do to help you through this suffering? Because they used to think this, that life is comfortable and they got it. But God says, you're going through this. I'm going to help you get through that. So it was in the pain that King Jay called out. It was in the pain when Clinton, Iowa will eventually call out. It's in the pain when a nation will call out. And it's a pain when a world will call out because God has something better for them. 
It's a pain that we will call out, and God says, our loving Father says, I am here for you, and I want something better for you. Verse 5 carries on, and this is something I've read over and over, and then finally this last time when I read it at the beginning of this year, the Lord provided someone to save them. And I love this idea of someone. See, we live in a world that everybody wants to get their name out. We live in a world that when you go to the supermarket or you go to any store, there's magazines filled with someones who are doing something. And we can read about these famous people, about the food they ate, the clothes they wear, whatever they did last weekend. And we can read about that because we live in a world that wants their brand, their name out there. We live in a world that wants to push those names and wants to push those ideas forward. But God says, I don't need the someones. I, I need the someones. I don't need these famous people. I need people who are just going to show up. I don't need a certain somebody. I just need someone to do this. I need someone who's ever, who can be anyone. Often people don't necessarily have to be amazing, but they are amazing because God says. See, we look at ourselves and say, I'm nothing, but God says, you are something. See, a someone is the single mother who works two jobs to provide for her son. A someone is the guy who continually goes to the dead-end job that isn't going to go any further, but he does it because that's what he has to do. The someone is someone you're sitting next to at McDonald's. The someone is the one driving the car in front of you when you leave church today. The someones are everywhere, and each and every one of us are all someone. Each and every one of us are someone who God has created. We make excuses saying, I'm not special, I can't do it, but God says, I created you, and I have something special for you. We have to stop thinking of how we are losing our video games and remember that God says, I've given you this. Or stop thinking about the warriors we don't have and remember that God says, I've created you for this. See, if someone was a Noah who God made for a specific time to build an ark to save his family and then save animals. A someone was a Moses who God created for a specific moment to lead his people out of Israel. These are all someones that we now know of, but they were just someones. In youth group, we started a series in labels, and I love the idea of thinking about labels because labels have power. And specifically, we're talking about labels like the label of a nerd, the label of a jock, the label of whatever, a cheerleader. And those, those labels will drive up images in your brain. And those labels have power. Sometimes those labels will create cages around you and control where you are, and sometimes those labels will lift you up. But the label of someone applies to each and every one of us. And it has the power to push us forward because someone has to do it. Someone has to be in that spot. And someone has to move forward and someone has to follow God. So if we take this idea that God provided someone, I think majority of us when we read this think that God provided a prophet. God provided a priest. God provided a pastor to do the work. But I love the idea that God provided someone because each and every one of us are someones. So let's look at what a someone could be. The someone could be the teacher who worked in an inner city classroom who showed up day after day just so his students would know that they were special and they were cared for. A someone is a businesswoman who raised money for children in Africa who were struggling or struggling and suffering from AIDS. A someone is a biker who rode across the United States just to raise money for cancer. The ra a someone is a barber who just decided that he would cut hair of children who are suffering from horrible diseases. A someone is a cashier who day in and day out would go to her job and just smile and say, I hope you have a great day and do it with joy and excitement in her voice. These are all someones. They did lasting, incredible things, but we'll never remember their names. Majority of you probably have heard the news that uh, the bombing that happened in Manchester, how horrible that horrific event is. But I love the little stories of the someones that are stepping up. The someones are the, the homeless man who stood with the lady as she eventually passed away. Or the homeless man who went over and held another person's leg because she was bleeding. Or the someone who helped the children get out. There were three or four at least homeless people who got up, who weren't even emergency workers, but got up, went out of their way and said, I'm going to be someone in this moment. I'm going to be someone that does something that's going to change these people. And now we know their stories through the news, but they were honestly no ones. They were homeless people that majority of the people probably didn't even notice that they were there. Majority of the people probably just walked by and said, those are just homeless people. But they said, I'm going to be someone in this situation. I'm going to be someone who makes a difference. 
And sometimes what we do is with this God provided, we say, I can't do this because I'm someone who struggles with something. I'm struggle, I have problems, and we start eliminating ourselves. But God says, I'm going to take a liar named Jacob to lead his people. I'm going to take somebody who struggles with anger to lead his people. That was Moses. I'm going to take somebody who was an adulterer and a murderer to lead his people once again, and that was David. I'm going to take someone who witnessed a murder and probably witnessed many other murders to write majority of the New Testament, and that someone was a Paul. So our labels that we apply to ourselves where we start eliminating ourselves, saying, I can't do this because I have this problem because I'm struggling with this, God says those labels don't exist. I don't see those labels. I have something planned for you. I have something better for you. Will you be that someone that stands up and says, I am going to do that? God continually says, I am waiting for you. God continually says, I am ready for you. With his arms open, will we be those someones? A someone isn't about a stage or a name. It's about his name. See, often what we do is say, I'm not on stage. I don't have a platform. But these people that are someones are stepping forth and they don't have a platform. Again, the homeless people was just there. That just happened to be where they are. You guys are where you are because God has a plan for you. A someone in 1994, this little chunky guy right here, that's me, <laughs> moved here in 1994 to go to high school here. Then he graduated and then he went away to college for five years. Five-year program. I didn't, I didn't say Five-year program, and then I worked for 10 years. All the time, God was bringing me back to Clinton, Iowa. At the time, I didn't want to move back to Clinton. I didn't want to do it because Clinton smells. I'll be honest. Stinks. <laughs> didn't want to do it. In fact, before we even moved in 1994, I didn't want to move to Clinton because I've never heard of Clinton. I didn't know what it was. But God eventually took this someone, this guy, that chunky little shy guy right there, and said, I'm going to use you to make a difference. And that difference was that there was a dark place, and God said, I have a vision for you that if you could change one dark place, you could change, begin changing the families. You could change the community. And that was one place that we go to, and it's called Clinton High. That was the most darkest place that I could think of because I know it was dark then, and I know that it's darker now. But I knew that if you could begin to change the people of Clinton High, if you begin to change, just give them a little light, a little hope, eventually you would change those people. And those people, as they graduate, would not only just change their families, but begin to change the communities, then begin to change the nation, because they go all over. And if you can change one place, one dark place, you can begin to change the world. So God said, this chunky, shy kid who doesn't really like people, I'm going to take that someone, and I'm going to put him up front, and I'm going to make him talk to people. This chunky, shy kid does not like kids, does not like people does not like being in front of people, does not like that at all. But God says, I'm going to take you. I'm going to use you. And my excuse was, I don't want to do that. That's not what I'm called to do. I'm not good at talking to people. I don't like people, God. Why are there so many people around me? But God says, I'm going to use you anyway. And then it came to the ultimate excuse. All I have, God, God said, you have me. What else do you need? And I said, well, I, I, I guess that's good enough. Then we start rationalizing my brain saying, I guess that's good. But God says, I'm going to use you to do something. Will you be that someone to step into that place? Will you be that someone? Because I'll be honest with you, 15 years ago, if I would have been sitting, 15, 20 years ago, if I'd been sitting here and the clock still said that there's 15 minutes left of service, I would be the one screaming in his head because the clock isn't moving fast enough. 15, 20 years ago, when the pastor said, I have three more points, I would be the one who, ah, I got to figure out a way out of here. This is, I'm not going to last it. Because I just wanted to get by. I didn't necessarily want to be here, but God says, I see something inside of you, and I'm going to plant something inside of you that will grow, and some passion, some desire for this community, for this city. So what you see now is a someone who is in front of you that said, God, please use me. Do whatever you want with me. One of my favorite someones is from the New Testament, and it's the someone who took his Lunchable to a party of 5,000 people, and God said, I'm going to take your Lunchable, and I'm going to feed 5,000 people. We are never going to know this boy's name. We are never going to know what he even did after he did this. This is the only thing we know about him. One little point. But God took that Lunchable and fed 5,000 people. He influenced so many people because of that. And still today we're telling the story of this kid that showed up. And he didn't do what we often do. See, what I think if I was in that situation and I showed up with my Lunchable and 12 strong, burly fishing men, whatnots, came and said, I want your Lunchable. I said, nope. 
This is my Lunchable. He's God. He can figure it out, can he? And we hold on. This is what we often do. We hold on to what we have, and we hold on to things, and God says, will you give it to me? Will you let me do something amazing with what you have? And the boy came forward, and he gave his Lunchable to Jesus, and then we know the rest that he provided for the 5,000 people, and we're still telling the story today. A someone is in a crowd, but the crowd doesn't control her. The crowd is just with her. And then she says, how am I going to change this crowd? How am I going to change this city? How am I going to change where I am? See, this boy had fears. And I believe every time we have a chance to step forward, we should have fears. But the fears shouldn't control us. This boy was probably afraid of the disciples. This boy was probably afraid of going front, in front of 5,000 people. But he got over it. He went through with it. So the Bible tells us in our story of King J, they were allowed, Israel was allowed to escape from King Aram. We don't know who this someone was, and we don't even know what they did, but we do know the results of what they did. We don't know exactly how they got out. Was there a battle? We don't know. Was there an arm wrestling match? We don't know. Did they play chess? We don't know. But someone stepped forward and said, I'm going to go against the King Aram, who has God's people under his thumb, and I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to set God's people free. And isn't that always our goal, to set God's people free? Shouldn't that always be our goal, to be the someone that does something to allow God's people to be set free? See, when you read this story, something you have to remember is that someone stepped forward, which means someone usually ends up doing what someone else didn't. See, it should have been King Jay. He should have been the one leading God's people out. He should have been the one who never even allowed God's people to get in this predicament, get in this situation. But, but what happened is King Jay said, I don't want to do that. And as he did that, it, God had to go ask somebody else, will you be the one to lead my people out of captivity? Will you be the one who directs them out of their pain, out of their suffering? And as I read this story, I often wonder if there actually hadn't been somebody else that was also asked that, God, that they decided to hold on to their Lunchable. They decided to hold on to what they had and say, God, you figure it out. I'm going to hold on to what I have. You do what you want to do. And they didn't, they didn't want to be the someone that God would use. They chose to be themselves. So God right now in your life is saying, you are the someone in many in the circle of friends that you have. You are the someone to make an influence. You are the someone to do something. You are the someone to do something in their lives that's going to help them get out of the king of Aram's kingdom. You are the someone that's going to help them set free from the darkness that they are struggling with. You are the someone that's going to make a difference in their life. You get to be that someone. You get to be that special someone that's going to make a difference, that's going to change everything in your lives and their lives. But you have to say, I am willing to do that. You have to step forward. You have to be willing to do that. The Bible then tells us this. So the people of Israel lived in their homes just as they had before. And I wish this could be our Walt Disney moment. I wish this could be the happily ever after that God's people finally figured it out. They decided to serve God and serve Jesus with everything they had. But they didn't. Because it ends with this. But the people didn't turn away from the sins of the royal house of Jeroboam. They didn't turn away. They returned back to where they were. They forgot about the someone who did something that changed everything. And they forgot about the pain. They forgot about the suffering. They forgot about calling out to God. And they went back to their old ways. They went back to what they had. They decided to seek after the bright, shiny objects again instead of seeking after God. And it's so sad because, again, we have the helicopter view of this, and we get to see the cycle that repeats over and over and over, and they continually reject God, and they continue to say, God, I don't need you. I'm going to do my own thing. And God says, I'm going to allow you to because I love you. I'm going to allow you to walk away. I'm going to allow you to figure it out that I love you and I care for you, but you're going to go through pain. And we begin saying, why can't they figure this out? Why do they continue choosing wrong things? Then we have to start looking at ourselves. Why can't we figure it out? Why do we continually making wrong choices? Why do we continually going down wrong paths? Why do we continually walking away from God? I found this podcast called Hardcore History. Uh, it's the narrator or the author is Dan Carlin. And I'm super fascinated with this guy. He takes little concepts that you often talked about, like in high school history or history of world events or wherever you 
you got your history from, and kind of explodes them. He goes in great detail of whatever that event is. One of the, ones, one of the first ones I listened to was about a man named Genghis Khan. And at the time, I didn't know anything about this man. All I knew was he was a man and that he wasn't a very nice man. Why I knew that, I don't even know. But they te- this guy tells a story, Dan tells a story about Genghis Khan, about how we don't even know if he actually existed. Some people say that he could have been a fairy tale. Some people say he could have been just a made-up man that some people just wish he would have existed. But either way, whether he was real or not, the things that were done underneath his name were amazing because he expanded his, the kingdom of the Mongols from the eastern to the western part of Asia. He had one of the largest kingdoms ever, all that were done underneath this Genghis Khan, whether he existed or not. Genghis Khan was a Mongol, and he, they were uh, nomadic people, meaning they traveled around. They couldn't live where they were because it was a horrible, horrible life. It was uh, freezing cold. It was just horrible, arid temperatures, and it was just a ter- ter- uh, excuse me, terrible place to live. So they had to leave it year after year, and then they would come back for just a little bit, and then they leave out. When Genghis Khan comes on the scene, he says, I'm going to no longer live here. What I'm going to do is start taking everybody out. I'm going to start expanding my empire so we no longer have to come back. So his empire just continually grew bigger and bigger and bigger, and he took out more and more countries, more and more civilization, to the point that he had to start training his army and figuring out ways to make them better. So he had this awesome, incredible idea so that they would never forget. He would send his armies, he'd rotate them back to the steppe, back to the area that was horrible, back to the area in which they had hardship and they had suffering. For two reasons. He wanted them never to forget the pain that they had left, never forget the circumstances that they left. They would always be reminded of that they never want to go back to that situation. Also, he wanted them never to become soft. He wanted them, the author says, never to be slipper-wearing, robe-wearing soldiers. Because if the soldiers ever became slipper-wearing, robe-wearing soldiers, they're never going to be great soldiers, and they're going to settle, and they're going to be comfortable with where they are. They're never going to be great warriors because a man wearing that comes at you, you're probably going to laugh at him. But a man who continually goes back to this hardship, a man who continually returns back to this suffering is going to, have, is going to be tough and is going to remember his pain, remember what he's gone through. So King Jay and the Israelites continually chose to reject God. They continually chose to walk away from God and they continually forgot the pain, the suffering that they went through. And that cycle continues on and on and on until eventually we come to a man named Jesus who comes to this earth. And he gave us a symbol called communion given to us so that we would never forget that someone loves us, that someone cares for us. See, the symbol of communion was bread that was broken to represent his body that was crushed. It was the symbol of the, the juice, the wine that was to represent his blood that was spilled for us. See, he gave us the symbol so that we would never forget the pain, that we would never forget the suffering that he did because he loves us. He gave us a symbol so that we would never forget that he cares for us and he did everything for us. Because Jesus knew that if we forget about the pain, if we forget about the suffering that he went through, then we'd become the comfortable Christians who just come to church and just sit. And if we become the comfortable Christians, then we just sit and nothing ever happens. We are never the some ones to do something amazing because we're just comfortable where we are. To be anyone is easy. To be anyone, all you have to do is do nothing. Anyone is somebody who doesn't sacrifice. Anyone is somebody who doesn't show up. Anyone is somebody that never goes out of their way. To be be someone, however, means that you have to be present. To be someone means you have to give up something of yourself. To be someone means you have to sacrifice something. To be someone means you're going to have to go out of your way to change your cities, to change your families, to change your worlds. To be someone is going to take something of yourself. Someone has to be willing to do something to change everything because God's given it to you. Because God says, I loved you. God says, I cared about you. God says, I want something better for you because he says, you are someone who is worth it. Let's pray. God, thank you so much for who you are. Thank you so much for just continually reminding us, giving us the symbol of communion so that we can remember what you went through for us. 
Thank you so much that you care for us and you died for us and you want something continually better for us, Jesus. And help us to be willing to go out of our way, to get out of our comfort zones, to go and to affect the people that we are around, Jesus. Help us just to um, be aware that you put us where we are and that you have something better for them. And then help us to come alongside those who are hurting and suffering, Jesus. And help us to be willing to be the someones that will do something that's going to change everything in our lives. Help us to always continue on more. In your name I pray. Amen.